three, two, one. Well, hello everybody and welcome to the December 2018 edition of the Space Association meetings. And this is our fourth in this series of Apollo at 50. We're titling this Footsteps to the Moon, Countdown to Apollo 11. Well, this series, for those of you who haven't been watching, is uh, providing a monthly progress support in the lead up to the execution of the Apollo 11 mission way back in July of 1969. And each month what we're doing, we're summarising the key activities that are happening all over the country and all over the world, in fact, that happened in that particular month 50 years ago. And we kicked off in September of 68, September of 2018, and we're going to comment in the Apollo 11 mission in July of 1969, which will be in 50 years later, July 2019. So it should be an exciting time. So we'll also uh, we'll be tracking all of those missions and all of those progress reports. In amongst that, we'll also be inserting a couple of specialist um, events, episodes. We'll be looking at the uh, Soviet F Union F efforts in the uh, space race. That'll be in our February meeting. Should be a great meeting. We'll be examining the Australian contributions to the Apollo program, of which there are quite a number and quite significant. At this stage, we're going to be looking at April for that, so make sure you tune back in for that. And we'll also be having a look at the Apollo mission mode selection, which I believe will be now in June of uh, 2019. So tonight, we're going to look back. It's December, and we're going to look back at the Apollo 8 mission, which took place in December of 1968. Now, as usual, we'll be using some high technology in order to make that time transition. And uh, we're going to get that ready now. Be careful. It can be quite nauseous for some viewers to in, in, uh, endure. So we'll be firing that up in just a moment. Here at Rockwell Automation's World Headquarters, research has been proceeding to develop a line of automation products that establishes new standards for quality, technological leadership, and operating excellence. With customer success as our primary focus, work has been proceeding on the crudely conceived idea of an instrument that would not only provide inverse reactive current for use in unilateral phase detractors, but would also be capable of automatically synchronizing cardinal gram meters. Such an instrument comprised of Dodge gears and bearings, Reliance electric motors, Allen Bradley controls, and all monitored by Rockwell Software is Rockwell Automation's retroencabulator. Now basically, the only new principle involved is that instead of power being generated by the relative motion of conductors and fluxes, it's produced by the modial interaction of magneto-reluctance and capacitive directance. The original machine had a base plate of prefamulated amulite surmounted by a malleable logarithmic casing in such a way that the two spurving bearings were in a direct line with a panometric fan. The lineup consisted simply of six hydrocoptic marzal vanes, so fitted to the ambifacient lunar wane shaft that side fumbling was effectively prevented. The main winding was of the normal lotus o deltoid type placed in panendermic semi boloid slots of the stator every seventh conductor being connected by a non-reversible tremi pipe to the differential girdle spring on the up end of the gram meters. Moreover, whenever fluorescent score motion is required, it may also be employed in conjunction with a drawn reciprocation dingle arm to reduce sinusoidal depleneration. The retroencabulator has now reached a high level of development, and it's being successfully used in the operation of Milford trenions. It's available soon wherever Rockwell Automation products are sold. Now fortunately, ladies and gentlemen, we've had an upgrade to our retro encabulator, and we're now able to use that as a time travel device. So we are now setting the date 
using the retro encapsulator to de December 28, 1968. And December 28 means with the Apollo 8 mission has just been completed, which is great for us. So what was happening in the world in 1968? Oh, well, there was quite a lot. So Elvis had just uh, completed his comeback special, seen by millions of people on TV. Project Schooner, one of the 27 nuclear American tests conducted as part of Project Plowshare, took place in Nevada. And uh, it basically sent uh, nuclear debris all around the world and uh, to the North Pole and the Soviet Union uh, detected it within one week. So it was pretty disgusting. There's the crater of that uh, nuclear test right there, even though it was underground. Douglas Engelbart of Sanford University publicly demonstrated his pioneering hypertech system, NLS, together with the computer mouse that would become retrospectively known as the mother of all demos. Look at that mouse. And the Tupolev Tu-144 became the first civilian supersonic airplane to take to the air two months before the Concorde, although it did not succeed this did not exceed the speed of sound until after the Concorde had done so, so there you go. Um, however, it was not particularly successful. It had a crash at the Paris Air Show, and it began commercial service in 77. It only took, uh, only made 55 flights and was discontinued in 78 uh, because of more crashes and very high operational costs. So that was a short-lived program. What else was happening in the world? So uh, U.S. Army Major James Rowe had been held for more than five years a prisoner of the Viet Cong. He managed to escape his captors. The Cambodia released 11 U.S. Army soldiers and one South Vietnamese non-com who had been held prisoner since July of 17 when their boat strayed into Cambodian waters. The largest number of people hijacked to Cuba since the practice began in 1959. 151 people on an Eastern Airlines flight were diverted to Havana uh, as their DC-8 jet was near the end of the flight. After the hijacker was taken into custody by Cuban security police, the remaining 143 passengers and seven crew were taken by bus to Vandero and put back on a plane to the US. There you go. And what else? And finally, North Korea released 82 members of the US Navy ship USS Pablo after 11 months of captivity. However, I believe the ship uh, is actually still in uh, North Korea and uh, it sits here on display, I believe. There's a picture of it sitting right here in the Pyongyang Harbour. What else? In Australia, Australia, well, we, uh, we had a very significant air crash in Western Australia with uh, Miller Airlines. 26 people were killed on board that uh, Vickers Bicount 720 prop plane. Uh, a referendum was held in Tasmania to allow the granting of a casino license to Rest Point. And a breathalyzer was introduced in New South Wales. Legislation was introduced to uh, make it an offence to be in control of a vehicle where there was a presence of alcohol and concentrations above a certain level. And there's a, an old breathalyzer from the day. Top 10. Well, the Beatles have been up there for quite some time. We've been reporting on that. But... This gem managed to slip in on December 11, uh, Little Arrows by Leapy Lee. We've got a sample of that. If you can put up with it, we'll play a little bit for you. There's a boy, a little boy, shooting arrows in the blue, and he's aiming them at someone, but the question is, at who? Is it me, or is it you? It's hard to tell until you're hit, but you'll know it when they hit you, cause they hurt a little bit. Pouring out of the blue A little arrow's for me and for you You're falling in love again Falling in love again Little arrows in your clothing Little arrows in your hair when All right, all right, we've, we've endured enough of that. Let's get, get rid of that. Oh, God. All right, what was happening in Apollo? Well, in December of 1968, there was a lot of stuff happening in the Vehicle Assembly Building. Um, on December the 1st, the Apollo 9 spacecraft 
was moved into the VAB to be mated with the Saturn V on the mobile launch in High Bay 3. And that's on the left. And uh, the first stage of the Apollo 10 launcher was being readied uh, for stacking in High Bay 2. So Apollo 10 on the left and Apollo 9 on the right. So a lot of stuff happening. Very busy times over there. Um, we recall a little while ago we had a problem with one of the training vehicles, uh, the uh, lunar landing training vehicle. Well, on December 8, uh, test pilot Joe Algaranti ejected from another one of these. There were three built, and I think this is the second one to have crashed. The other one was with uh, Neil Armstrong, and he uh, he punched out of his one in May. So um, they thought they'd fixed everything, and he had a had a problem, this guy had a problem and uh, destroyed another one, so they only had one left. But the astronauts all loved it and they thought it was great training. Uh, Apollo 9 spacewalk preparations were well and truly underway. Uh, Rusty Swigert and Alan Bean in the middle were testing their suits uh, under vacuum conditions. And um, and the Johnson Space Center, uh, Scott was also testing his uh, intra-vehicular suit as well. And other things happening, December 9, preparations for Apollo 8 uh, for the schedule for the 21st of December, well on schedule. Um, they'd uh, had uh, some checking of leaks and testing and making sure that everything was working. Uh, the CM reaction control system and the service propulsion system Hypergolic loading on the November 30 and uh, loading of the uh, S1C uh, stage with fuel on December 2nd. December 14, Apollo manager Wilmot Hess, the uh, Manned Space Flight Center Director for Science and Applications, we have to cut all this out. On uh, December 14, the ASPO manager asked Wilmot Ness, Manned Space Flight Centre Director of Science and Applications, to devise crew fit and function check of lunar hand tools before the lunar module LM LM5 crew training tests. Function checks of the hand tools as well as early Apollo Science Experiment Package, ES EASEP, had been agreed on November 26th review. Actual flight hardware will be used by the crewmen to verify operation of tools and experiments. So they're going to be flying to the moon in uh, seven months and they're still working on the equipment. So it's a lot of stuff. Uh, once again, some more stuff happening in the VAB. Uh, we saw that picture of the first stage and the uh, uh, Apollo 9 command service module on December 3. Uh, the Apollo 9 command service module was hoisted to be mated to the Saturn V. And you can see the folded legs in there in the spacecraft adapter. And on the right, docking test of the Apollo 10 command module and the lunar module uh, were underway in the vacuum cha in the altitude chamber. So uh, they flipped up the lunar module and made sure it actually fit, which is a good idea. Uh, some other stuff happening in December. Final countdown for, for the Apollo 8 mission was happening. Uh, and uh, included a wet countdown demonstration test. Apollo 16, December 16, Apollo Program Director Sam Phillips asked uh, George Lowe for comments on potential uses for television aboard all Apollo spacecraft, command module and lunar module, although plans call for TV cameras in both spacecraft for the F&G missions, the later missions. Um, only the lunar module was to contain a camera. Phillips asked Lowe to assess the feasibility and schedule impact of including TV on the D missions C command module uh, as well, thus employing television on all the remaining Apollo spacecraft. In particular, Apollo Director sought Lowe's advice on the feasibility and usefulness of television transmissions. Thank goodness he did that. Uh, more stuff happening. Apollo 9 crew, McDivitt, Scott and Swigert in front of their Apollo, Apollo 8 launch vehicle at 39A. Bit of a photo op, and then Schweigert was on board a KC-31 practicing ingress and egress on the command module mock-up. December 21, Apollo 8 was launched from the Kennedy Space Center. 
7.51 a.m. And December 27, it returned back to Earth and they splashed down in the Pacific. The crew was in excellent condition and uh, all the major objectives of the mission was accomplished. So, there's the launch, there's that famous picture and there's the logo of the mission. So listen, rather than go through all of those items myself, there's a wonderful documentary that NASA has just released and we're going to show it to you now. You'll be the first people in the world to see it. December 21st, 1968. The shortest day of the year, but in significance, perhaps one of the longest in the flow of history. This is Apollo Saturn launch control. We are still go at this time. T minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. Four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit. We have. We have liftoff. Liftoff at 7:51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have cleared the top. Tower clear. 13 seconds. The United States was undertaking the most distant voyage ever attempted by man. For the first time, three Americans rode the Saturn V moon rocket. Houston, you are go for staging, Owen. Jim Lovell and Bill Anders were about to leave their cradle Earth and face the infinite frontier. Apollo 8, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. Apollo 8, you are go for TLI. Over. Roger, understand. We're go for TLI. TLI, translunar insertion. This was the commitment. Borman, Lovell, and Anders were ready for the maneuver that would send them to the moon. As the world listened and watched, its people were overtaken by a new awareness, an awareness that they were perhaps witnessing the overture to the ultimate destiny of man. Lovell confirms ignition. And the thrust is okay, Booster says. On board the spacecraft, and in mission control, the men of Apollo 8 watched the readouts. Velocity build up in feet per second. The numbers snowballing toward the velocity that would allow the spacecraft to escape Earth's gravity. Okay, we got and Borman says we've got Seco. Cutoff was right on the second. With the cutoff of their third stage engine, Apollo 8 was traveling faster than had any men before a coasting uphill climb against the pull of their native planet. Now the third stage, the S-4B, was just useless mass to them. It was jettisoned, then later placed into an orbit around the sun. The crew of Apollo 8 turned around for a look. Uh, Houston, Apollo 8, how do you read? Yeah, loud and clear, Frank, how are you? Roger, we're uh, loud and clear. We're taking pictures of the S-4B. Uh, the uh, post-separation sequences is uh, completed and we seem to have a high gain. Give us clues to what it looks like from way up there. Roger. I can see the entire Earth now out of the center window. I can see Florida, Cuba, Central America, 
the whole northern half of Central America, in fact, all the way down through Argentina and down through uh, Chile. Hey, you picked a good day for it. Houston, for information, I'm looking through the scanning telescope now, and I see millions of stars, most of them uh, the bending from the S-4B. The crew of Apollo 8 now settled down to the routine of the outward flight. Systems checks, observations, navigational star sightings. Uh, Jim, uh, I've just been uh, looking at your, your marks with respect to uh, accuracy, and they figure they're within uh, a couple thousandths of a degree of the uh, theoretical optimum. Lovell's proficiency in navigating the spacecraft with its onboard optical instruments would eventually earn him the nickname, the man with the golden fingers. His speed was such that he would be requested to slow down so that the earthbound machines recording the data could keep up with him. The accuracy of his sightings was virtually flawless, symbolic of the entire mission, a mission so accurate that several of the planned mid-course corrections would be dropped as unnecessary. Astronauts, spacecraft, flight controllers, computers. The precision was fantastic. Then on the second day out, the world looked in on the crew via television. This transmission is coming to you approximately halfway between the moon and the earth. We've been uh, 31 hours, about 20 minutes into the flight. We have about uh, less than 40 hours left to go to the moon. So Apollo 8 glided on silently, farther from Earth than man had ever before been, a microscopic dot of life in the cosmic void. Around the world, in Goldstone, California, Madrid, Spain, Canberra, Australia, the gigantic antennas of the deep space network tracked Apollo 8, received its communiques, picked up the voice of its telemetry. Only for the 40 minutes of its transit behind the moon on each orbit would Apollo 8 lose contact with Earth. Then, on the day before Christmas, the network zeroed in on the spacecraft television antenna for the second broadcast to Earth. All right, you're all looking at yourselves to see from 180,000 miles out in space. Mike, what I uh, keep imagining is if I'm a, some lonely traveler from another planet, what I think about the Earth from this altitude, whether I think it'd be inhabited or not. Don't see anybody waving, is that what you're saying? Well, I'm just kind of curious uh, whether I would land on the blue or the brown part of the Earth. You better hope we land in the blue part. Shortly after they turned off the television camera, Borman, Lovell, and Anders ended their long climb away from Earth. Crossing the point where the gravity of Earth and Moon just balanced, they became the first men to fall toward another celestial body. Now the time approached for the most immense commitment of the mission, Lunar Orbit Insertion, LOI. A burn of the service module engine would place Apollo 8 into orbit around the moon. Up to this time, without further major maneuvers, the spacecraft would loop around the moon and return to Earth. Once the burn was made, Apollo 8 would be held by the moon's gravity field until a later burn would push it free. Apollo 8, this is Houston at 6804, your goal for LOI. Okay, Apollo 8 is go. Uh, you're riding the best bird we can find. Lunar orbit insertion would take place on the backside of the moon. With the moon between the spacecraft and the Earth, all contact would be lost until it appeared on the other side. In mission control, they anticipated LOS, loss of signal from Apollo 8. Now, Mission Control and the world could only wait. Wait for the first contact with Apollo 8 as it emerged from behind the moon. We've got it, uh, we've got it. Apollo uh, 8 now in, in lunar orbit. Uh, there's a chair in the, this room. Uh, this is Apollo Control Houston, uh, switching now to the voice of Jim Level. By 60.5, good to hear your voice. The burn was as close to perfect as possible. Later burns would circularize the orbit, and the three astronauts would circle the moon ten times in 20 hours. Sunrise, sunset, every two hours on an alien world.
and they would take pictures, still photographs as well as motion picture film, here seen at a much faster rate than orbital velocity. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, uh, what does the old moon look like from 60 miles, over? Okay, uh, Houston, the moon is essentially gray, no color, looks like plaster of Paris, okay, or uh, sort of a grayish beach sand. We can see quite a bit of detail. Uh, the equator craters are all rounded off. There's quite a few of them. Some of them are newer. Many of them look like, uh, especially the round ones, look like uh, hit by meteorites or projectiles of some sort. Langridus is quite a huge crater. It's got a central cone to it. The walls of the crater are, are terraced, uh, about uh, six or seven different terraces on the way down. The world saw and heard the first live telecast of the lunar surface. Hey, Bill, how would you describe the color of the moon from here? Uh, the color of the moon looks uh, a very whitish gray, like uh, dirty beach sand, and uh, with lots of footprints in it. Don't these two craters look like uh, pickaxes striking uh, concrete, leaving a lot of fine decayed dust? Scientist, engineer, astronaut, the world, all followed the progress of Apollo 8. For this was preparation, an advanced scout marking the way for those who would follow, those who would orbit, those who would land, navigate, track, observe, record, describe. There's no trouble picking out uh, features that we learned up about. Certainly looks like uh, we're picking the more interesting parts of the moon to land in. The backside uh, looks like a sand pile. My kids have been playing in for a long time. It's all beat up, no definition, just a lot of bumps and holes. The area that we're over right now uh, uh, gives some hint of uh, possible volcanic, so I really can't uh, eyeball it at the moment to uh, pin that down, though there are some. Uh, then a Christmas Eve message the world could not forget. Welcome to the moon, Houston. Thank you. The moon is a uh, different thing to each one of us. I know my own impression is that it's a, a vast, lonely, forbidding type existence or expanse of nothing. It looks rather like clouds and clouds of pumice stone. Beyond technology, beyond science, Apollo 8 was bringing to the world a new awareness, an expansion of mind and spirit that must forever alter the perspective of humanity, physically and philosophically. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. There was little time for the crew of Apollo 8 to reflect. The next job was to make sure that the spacecraft was ready for the most critical maneuver of the mission, the firing of the service module engine for TEI, trans-Earth insertion, and the trip home. There was no go, no-go decision on this one. It had to go. All systems are go, Apollo 8. Thank you. For the final time, Apollo 8 passed behind the moon out of contact with Earth for this most critical of all the burns. On the ground, men waited. Apollo 8, Houston. Apollo 8, Houston. Apollo 8, Houston. Apollo 8, Houston. Apollo 8, over. Hello, Apollo 8. Loud and clear. Roger. Please be informed there is a Santa Claus. That's a plenty. You're yeah, the best one to know. Three very tired astronauts were on their way home. And with them rode an army of engineers, scientists, technicians, programmers, flight controllers, all those whose dedicated efforts were Apollo 8. After catching up on their rest, homeward bound, there was more a mood of elation 
contrasted with the outbound loneliness. I told Michael, you guys are up there, and uh, he said, who's driving? That's a good question. I think Isaac Duke is doing most of the driving right now. We were enjoying the holiday, in the Christian world, Christmas. And we pause for a moment in our celebrations to watch three travelers heading home. As many of us sat down to our Christmas meal, Borman, Lovell, and Anders were enjoying theirs. It appears that we did a grave injustice to the food people. Santa Claus brought us some, a TV dinner each, which is delicious. Turkey and gravy, cranberry sauce, grape punch, outstanding. Glad well, Jim, glad to hear it. Yeah, we're down here eating cold coffee and bologna sandwiches. As on the way out, there were periods of work. The navigational ability of the spacecraft and crew was proving phenomenal. And periods of rest, a single man on watch. Well, Ken, that just leaves you or I. How about uh, you and I? Anything exciting happen today? Real quiet down here. Uh, everybody's smiling. Everything's pretty, pretty calm, like it should be on Christmas. Very good. Yeah, Mel says we're in a period of relaxed vigilance. Very good. We'll relax, you'll be vigilant. The final television transmission, 97,000 miles out, farther than man had been on any previous mission, but now tantalizingly close to home. I uh, think I must have the feeling that the travelers in the old sailing ships used to have going on a very long voyage away from home, and uh, now we're headed back, and uh, I have that feeling of being proud of the trip, but still, uh, still happy to be going back home and back to our home port. Every second brought the spacecraft closer to its fiery entry, the final plunge to the safety of Earth. On the morning of December 27th, the word was given to Apollo 8 the pyrotechnic devices that would separate the command and service modules prior to entry were armed. Apollo 8, Apollo 8. Your go for pyro arm, everything's looking good. Roger, everything's looking good here, Ken. On schedule, the command module jettisoned the service module to expose the main heat shield, aligned itself to entry attitude, and slammed into the atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour, faster than man had ever traveled until Apollo 8. A tracking aircraft took these films of the entry, the spacecraft seen as an incandescent fireball, With the temperature on the heat shield reaching 5,000 degrees, the communications were blacked out. The men in mission control waited once more. Ken Mattingly just put in a call and just frankly labeled it a radio check. He's gotten no responses yet. Ken Mattingly puts in a, another call. And there, there's Jim Lovell. We're in real good shape here, Jim. Real fine. The landing was right on target. Later, Frank Borman would report passing over the recovery ship as Apollo 8 drifted down toward the sea on its parachutes. As Borman, Lovell, and Anders stepped onto the carrier deck, a huge and patriotic celebration broke loose in mission control, a celebration echoed by the hundreds of thousands of men and women who were Apollo 8. 
Again, it's a fellow control here. I'm not sure how well our voice is getting out. Uh, there is a tremendous roar, an undercurrent of roar in the background. And I have never seen uh, the degree of this emotional outpouring in any previous mission, including Alan Shepard's. I've seen uh, rallies in locker rooms after championship games. I've seen happy politicians after elections, but I, and none of them do justice to the spirit pervading this room. But the triumph of Apollo 8 was beyond the bounds of nationalism. It was a fruition of the ages of humanity. The first Chinese setting off a gunpowder rocket. The Englishman, Newton. The German, Kepler. The Russian, Tsiolkovsky. The American, Goddard. For one moment in history, the nations of Earth were united in the eternity of deep space. In Havana, in Washington, in London, in Moscow, in Tokyo. All of mankind joined three Americans orbiting 60 miles above a stark, lifeless world. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. The vast loneliness up here on the moon is uh, awe-inspiring, and it makes you realize just what you have back there on Earth. The Earth from here is a grand oasis of the big vastness of space. Give us, O oh God, the vision which can see thy love in the world in spite of human failure. Give us the faith to trust the goodness in spite of our ignorance and weakness. Give us the knowledge that we may continue to pray with understanding hearts. And show us what each one of us can do to set forward the coming of the day of universal peace. Amen. Okay, so now it's time to head back to 2018. So now we're back to December 17, 2018. I hope that uh, time travel wasn't too traumatic for you. All right, so let's look at what's happening for our next meeting, which is January. January, we're looking at January 1969, the year we hopefully will land on the moon. And that will kick off, hopefully, with uh, Apollo 9. So our next uh, meeting, our January meeting, will be the 28th. And we hope to see everybody along there. So there's the Apollo 9 crew saying hi to us. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Tune in again, and uh, we'll uh, see you in January.